So without taking up too much more of our next speaker's time, please help me welcome from Florida, Dr. Jeff Baker. Jeff. Am I got this right now? Yeah. Put this on. Put this on my belt. Yeah. Maybe that'd be better on the other side, Bo. There. Are they shooting at us? Or what is that? Are there. Did the federal show up at this place? Are you already gunning for me? Or? Down in down in Texas, I understand. It is, from what I understand. Um, a little dicey down in Texas. We're getting reports now that Butch and uh, the gang in the state of Texas may be moving on the Republic or Republics of Texas. You might want to keep them in your prayers and you might want to keep the entire situation in your prayers, folks, because wisdom is going to be needed on both sides. I have found that government has very little wisdom Unfortunately, I, I, I think that there is a lack of wisdom perhaps on, on both sides. And I think we need at this point in time to pray that there will be peace because the last thing we want is another Waco, another bloodshed. The last thing we want is another 87 people butchered alive at the hands of people calling themselves government. But it, it is, ladies and gentlemen, it is the nature of things. Unfortunately, it is unfortunately the nature of man when he devolves into nothing but a sin nature to become stupid. See, sin makes you very, very stupid. We are a very, very, very sinful nature, so we are very, very, very stupid people. We can prove it. We elected Bill Clinton for a second term. Sin makes you stupid. Newt Gingrich is still in office. Folks, we are moving to a time when blood and destruction are going to reign. When all that we know is going to disappear. When all that was and is and has been is not going to be anymore. And life as we know it is, frankly, going to vaporize in front of our eyes. I, I wish, I wish like some of the pillow prophets that you see on television, that I could bring you sweet things and tell you that all is well, not to worry about anything. But frankly, ladies and gentlemen, I can't do that. Number one, I have no financial interest in lying to you. As do the pillow prophets on the television. See, if they tell you bad things, you aren't going to fill their coffers with lots of money. Who's going to pay to find out that America's going to burn? Hey, that doesn't fill the collection plates. When you tell people that we're at the ride of the fourth horseman and that death and hell are on the horse, <laughs> that don't fill the coffers. That don't even put butts in the pews. That wears out the hinges on the doors. I'm not here to tell you all as well. In fact, I'm here to tell you that all is hell and it's about to break loose. And it's about to engulf this nation and swallow us. And if you're not prepared for it, if you're not prepared for that which is about to come upon us, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that you're going to be destroyed. It's that simple. If you haven't started making your preparations, this would be a good time to undertake that task. 
You need to prepare physically. Bo asked me if I was storing up for hard times, and he looked at my pouch today on my, uh, on my suit. But hey, when famine comes, brother, I'm hanging in. <laughs> Actually, I've lost about 10 pounds since I saw him last time. He just liked being mean to me, I think. But I told him I was just following his example as I patted his rotundness. I think one of the things we better be doing we better be getting in shape a little bit. So I've lost about 15 pounds. We've got a couple more to go. I think that's one of the physical preparations we need to make. Right now, my idea of exercise is jogging from my desk to the kitchen. I'm fixing to change that, however. We need to make the physical preparation. Listen, if you don't have food put away, I think you're flirting with danger. I don't know about you, but starving to death doesn't appeal to me. We're coming to a time of famine. We'll talk about it. You need to prepare emotionally. I told Marsha the other day, it was a blistering hot day down in Tampa, and I said, you know, during the Depression, I sure am going to miss air conditioning. Because it's coming, folks. on its way. But more than that, you better prepare spiritually. Listen, if your idea of restoring the nation is rebuilding the constitutional precepts that we had, then you're going to fail. Because the destruction of the Constitution, ladies and gentlemen, is not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. The problem is the lawlessness of the people of this land. We have become a, a class of hedonistic whores that cares about nothing but our own self-serving gratification. I talked to the secretary of a senator, the secretary now retired. She said on even important votes like NAFTA and GATT, a congressman or a senator will sell his vote for as little as $2,000. ain't even expensive whores anymore. $2,000 they'll commit high treason, ladies and gentlemen. What kind of state do you think we have in a nation that would elect such people? Does the future look bright and rosy to you? You know, I keep hearing this expression, God bless America one more time. You want this blessed? Butch Reno murdering people in Waco? Bill Clinton selling the station out? Selling drugs? Pedophilia? You want it blessed one more time? No. Let the judgment come. There was a time when I prayed for the restoration of the land and the Lord has stopped me. I've got to tell you, folks, I, I'm not going to come to you and pretend to be a big shot, pretend to be anything. I'm not. I'm nobody. I run a little two-bit radio network that nobody, frankly, cares much about. I don't have 600 stations like Flush Bimbo. I got 24 stations that grudgingly carry me once in a while and whine at me about how radical we are. I don't come to you as a big shot prophet. I'm not. I'm not a church leader. No, no self-respecting church wants me around. I received the left foot of fellowship for most of the uh, important churches in the country. Now, if you're looking for somebody to follow, you've already blown it. <laughs> I'm the last guy in the world you want to follow, folks. I'm a frail human being like all of you. And there are days when I get up grumpy just like you do. And there's times when you call me on the phone and I just won't talk to you. I just don't have time.
Now I got the lowliest job in the whole place. Yahweh didn't even give me the job of the night watchman inside. Out of the weather. He made me the watchman on the wall. I stand out in the storms and in the weather and in the rain. I ain't a big shot. I'm sort of the expendable type. Sort of like a big lighter, you know, kind of one of those throwaway type things. And when the shooting starts, folks, when you start warning the people that the enemy is coming, the arrows are coming from both directions. <laughs> there ain't even, ain't even much place to go. I take just about as much heat from the Christian community as I do from the world. I'm trying to decide most of the time who's the enemy. But it doesn't matter. Because my job is simple. Lord knows I'm not the brightest guy in the whole world. So he didn't give me a complicated message. My job's real, real easy. I see the enemy storming the wall. I scream as loud and as long as I can and tell you they're coming. And if you respond, you respond. If you don't respond, there's not much I can do about it. Except keep hollering. And that's why the Lord gave us a radio network so we could holler. They're coming. And heaven knows there isn't a lot of glory in it. We're <laughs> running a little two-bit radio network. About the only ones that listen to us on a regular basis are, well, there are a few out there in the hustings that do, but the government listens on a pretty regular basis. <laughs> By the way, to any of our federal officers in the crowd, we appreciate you being here. Lord willing, you're going to come under condemnation and get saved before you get out of this place. If not, you've been warned at least, so when you're burning forever in the fires of hell, you will at least have known before you got there. The government listens to us on a pretty regular basis. By the way, they aren't real crazy about us. Butch Reno has threatened on a number of occasions to have me hauled in front of a grand jury in Washington. The last time I got the word, I threatened to go. Well, I think it's only fair. They're going to haul me in. See, once they ask you a question, you can over-answer. You can't have a lawyer there, so they expect everybody to under-answer. But once they ask you a question, you can over-answer. I figure I can slide into a preaching filibuster for about 10 days, two weeks. Maybe we'll get the grand jury saved and indict Butch while we're there. We're already in Washington, what the hey? You see, we've come to that, folks. We've come to a point now where they take little guys like me, preacher of the gospel. They'll threaten us with imprisonment and with grand juries and with indictments. And somehow I'm supposed to cower from it. Well, I've seen what Yahweh can do. And I've seen what they can do. If I have to face one of them mad, I'll choose not to face Yahweh mad. And that's the point you better be coming to, folks. This isn't about politics. It ain't the Republicans are the good guys and the Democrats are the bad guys or the Democrats are the good guys and the Republicans are the bad guys. And H. Ross Pro is not a knight in shining armor. He's just another whore waiting to sell you out. And it would be blessed if it was just the government that has sold us out. Because governments come and go. But ladies and gentlemen, this is not a governmental problem. The church started all this. And when the church became the whore church, everything has been downhill ever since. You see, the problem we've got in this country isn't the government. The government simply reflects us, simply reflects what we are. Malingering cowards. When they passed Roe versus Wade, the church should have stood up, marched on Washington, and built gallows outside of the Supreme Court. And said, repeal or swing. We didn't. 
barely a murmur. A bunch of cowardly pew warming. You see, folks, the problem is the problem is the same problem that it's always been. The Pharisees were the horrors. They were willing to sell the children of Israel out. They led them to the path of destruction. The church today is the same way. You think the guy with the funny hair and the accent down in Orlando is doing anyone any good? No, he's lining his own pockets, folks. All of these pillow prophets telling you all is well. When all hell breaks loose on earth, what's it going to be like for you? We've got this, we've got this revival, quote revival going on in Pensacola, Florida. You know, it's just like the Toronto Blessing. And they're doing the most bizarre things you can imagine. They're barking and baying at the moon. And one guy is doing a swan imitation, in the Lord, of course. They're lurching in the spirit. Scripture talks about a young boy that they brought to the disciples. And the scripture said that oftentimes the spirit would grab him and he'd lurch and he'd throw him into the fire trying to burn him or into the river and try and drown him. These idiots are walking into this church to get this lurching spirit and as long as they're lurching, they know that you're preaching in the spirit. If they stop lurching, you're supposed to stop preaching. Scriptures describe it as a demon and they're standing in line to get it. And that's what passes for religion today. Well, we need a few mileposts, folks. Revelation chapter 6. Daniel chapter 7. And I, and I was saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer this, ladies and gentlemen, is the passages that talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. There are two main schools of thought on this. One is that it already happened a long time ago. The other one is that, well, that it's coming a long time in the future. And I'm telling you that right now we are in the ride of the fourth horseman of the apocalypse, and I believe that we can find who the other three were so that you might have a milepost in history. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. Then a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Go back to Daniel chapter 7. Verse 3. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. I believe these two verses are corollary verses. They are describing the same beast. The white horse came forward, and him that sat on him had a bow and a crown, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Daniel chapter 7, verse 4, and it was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. Think now of a shield. A picture in your mind of a nation that uses the white horse and the bow and the crown and the two lions facing one another with a big red heart, the heart of a man. And they went forth conquering and to conquer, and the sun never set on the British Empire as they went forth conquering and to conquer. And you see on their shield to this day the bow and the crown and the white horse and the two lions standing. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, this was, this first horse was and is the British Empire. And it is still riding. This becomes particularly important in light of Revelation 13, but we'll get to that shortly. The second horse. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Okay, now let's add it up here. Red horse, he had power to take peace from the earth, had a great sword. Sword is what? War. So he was red, took peace from the earth, how? With war. Daniel chapter 7. Oh, by the way, on the first 
beast in Daniel 7? Notice that lion. What kind of wings did it have? The wings of an eagle. Sound familiar? And they were plucked off. You find out later in Revelation where they were set down. They were set down in the wilderness to protect the woman bearing the gospel for a time. I believe those wings were America that were plucked off and they were set down in this wilderness to protect the gospel for a time. Second beast, and behold, another beast, a second like to a bear. And it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, and between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Okay, so we got a red horse who takes peace from the earth with a sword. You got a bear that raises itself up on one side. Does it, when you start putting all this together, red and bear, does that bring anything to mind? And it raised itself up on one side, what side? Probably the left side. And it had three ribs in the teeth of it. The Soviet Union had to conquer three historic empires to become the Soviet Union. And it took peace from the earth. How did the Cold War start? Russia. When we, the United States of America, financed the Communist Revolution through Rockefeller Gold via Jacob Schiff, we created that beast. As you recall, it was the American bankers, including George Bush's daddy, that helped finance and helped scheme and dream this whole thing up. Why? Because war, ladies and gentlemen, had always been the most profitable of all ventures. Did you know that war is still more profitable even than the CIA's drugs? War. Why do we have to create the Soviet Union? To create a counterpoise to the United States. We had to. We had to have a Cold War so that we could have an armaments buildup. You see, this all dates back to the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar, they sent them over to the Middle East, to Jerusalem, supposedly to guard the roads going in so the pilgrims could make their pilgrimages to Jerusalem, to the Holy City. Well, they didn't guard squat. They went out hunting for temple treasures, and they found them. And they came back with the equivalent of billions of dollars in gold. Simple treasures. That's what set up the international banking houses. And here's a little game they played. They'd go to the king of the north and they'd say, Hey, king, you old boy. <laughs> the kingdom of the south fixing to make war on you. The king of the north would go into an absolute panic. War? Well, I don't have an army. I don't have weapons. I don't have horses, shields, spears. What am I going to do? And the Rothschild banker said, Well, gosh... We can loan you the money so that you can get all that stuff. One little requirement, of course, we take over your finances. Hey, I'd rather have you in control of my finances than have them in control of my kingdom. So he'd loan them the money. And then the next day, the arms merchants had come in. They worked for the same guys. So the money they just loaned the king, they'd get back plus a whole lot more by selling them arms. Slick deal, huh? And they'd go to the guy in the south and they said, hey, king to the north buying a whole bunch of soldiers and arms and spears and shields and horses. He's fixing to make war on you. Of course, the king to the south would go into a panic. Well, we have no horses. We have no army. We have no spears. And the Rockefeller bankers, actually the Rothschild bankers at that point in time. By the way, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds are the same family. According to a Rothschild historian, who is a Rothschild himself, now a believer, two brothers took the names, Rothschild and Rockefeller. They're the same family. The Rothschild banker would tell the king to the south, hey, we can loan you the money, don't worry about a thing. Of course, the only thing we require is that we take over your finances. Well, that's better than having that bozo up north taking over my country they'd finance wars. Still doing it. 
after World War I. The Treaty of Versailles guaranteed World War II. Who was there brokering the peace? Same guys that started the war in the first place. In fact, it was embarrassing. You had two brothers running the finances. Max Warburg was running the finances for Germany. Paul Warburg was running the finances for the United States. These idiots were meeting in Greenland and Iceland about every six to eight weeks to determine how World War I was going to come out. How long it was going to last. Nobody even bothered to notice this until they got to the peace table. And the press was so incensed that Paul Warburg was there representing the U.S. and Max running the, the show for the Germans that Paul finally had to withdraw from the peace negotiations, at least formally. Winston Churchill said of World War II, had the United States stayed out of World War II, excuse me, out of World War I, it would have been a small land skirmish that would not have lasted long because neither side could have afforded to have prosecuted the war. In other words, they'd have thrown rocks at each other for six months and gone home. But we got involved and turned it into a world war. You know, we like to do things in a big way in this country. So then we came up with World War II. That was a real hard one to get into. Nobody wanted a war here. Except the powers that be, of course. We had to actually talk the Japanese into bombing Pearl Harbor. We had to cut off their oil supplies. We had to screw up their manufacturing. We had to do about everything you can possibly think of to get them mad enough at us that they'd go after Pearl Harbor. And even then we knew it was coming. the best kept secret in the country, at least in Hawaii, every place else they knew about it. War is a profitable game. So we set up the Soviet Union to take peace from the earth. Who do you think profits with the Patriot missiles and the military industrial complex? It's the powers that be. It's the George Bushes and Bill Clinton's bosses. And yet it was prophesied. You see, things really shouldn't catch us by surprise, but they typically do because we typically don't, we typically don't see. And you don't hear this in the church. The church's idea of, of preaching is John 3.16 or a variation thereof, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. I know some elders that have been saved 18 times this year. We got them walking the altars till they're wearing their shoes out. Well, that's not the gospel. It's a tiny little piece of the gospel. But yet the church doesn't want to talk about prophecy. The church doesn't want to talk about the destruction of America. The church doesn't want to talk about the law of the Lord because, see, if you do, the rooms don't fill up. How many of you saw me when I was out at the Crystal Cathedral? Because I wasn't there. <laughs> or at Benny Hinn's church. Wasn't there too. Frankly, my kind, of, my kind of message doesn't sell all that well. This is about the remnant, folks. You know, it's funny. People stay away in droves to hear me speak. <laughs> Why? Because, folks, I'm not going to give you pablum. So if you want mush and pablum, go to your local church. They'll be more than happy to pass it out to you in almost every case. Oh, there are a few good preachers out there. I know there are. And I shouldn't paint with too broad a brush because there are some good ones. You may have a good one. Probably not. Probably even if you don't have a good one, you think he is. because he's yours. It's like your congressman. Every one of them is bad except, except yours. And I know yours is okay because you keep reelecting him. I better get back to Revelation. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and behold, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. 
And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Daniel, chapter 7, verse 6. And this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Interesting passage. This is the fourth, the third beast, and somehow it's got to line up with this black horse. We've got a leopard with four heads and four wings, and it's got to line up with a black horse. Well, first place, let's see if we can get a bit of a historical perspective. What nation came to power after the Soviet Union at a time of great famine and economic distress? A measure of wheat for a penny, that was a day's wage. And a measure of barley, or three measures of barley for a penny, also a day's wage. Didn't Adolf Hitler come to power at such times? The people clamored for a leader. Give us someone who can lead us out of this morass. Give us someone to give us pride back in ourselves. But how does a black horse fit in with a leopard? Well, what do you call a leopard that has no spots that's all black? Panther, like the panther divisions, perhaps, of Nazi Germany. A leopard without spots is, well, a panther without spots is, a, is an animal that is all dark, mysterious, stealthy. It is black. It has that occultic look to it, that occultic feel to it. What have we built our entire space program on here in the United States? The work of the Nazi scientists. Go to them, talk to them. What is it that they see? What is it that they believe? They all believe that they are channeling beings from great beyond somewhere. Listen, you, th you think these scientists are logical, organized people that if anything would be atheists, right? Most of them aren't. Most of them are into the occult. I, I just met with a number of them. I just met with one of them who believes he's channeling Palladians. Palladians, by the way, are people from a, some planet called Palladia. I'm, yeah, you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. You see, the entire Nazi regime was built upon the occult, occultism. And this, this leopard that has no spots, this panther, has four heads. Well, he had four main generals. It has two wings, two sets of two wings. Italy and Japan, the powers that went with it. Italy was steeped in the occult. Japan is the most occultic nation on the face of the earth. Perfect allies for Nazi Germany. And dominion was given to the beast. Well, I'd say it had plenty of dominion. Started a world war. And it was this black horse that was riding, and it came at a time when the people would literally work all day. Remember, the Treaty of Versailles caused the German people so much economic hardship that they would work all day for enough wages to eat. The story is told of the man who took a wheelbarrow full of money down to the grocery store to get a day's food. And when he came back, the money was there, but the wheelbarrow was gone. A day's wages for just enough food to get by. Famine has a tendency to bring that out in people. And Adolf Hitler was the ultimate occultist. Remember, he gave himself to Satan at a very early age. He was a member of the Thule Society. Prior to that, he had given himself over to a spirit that he encountered. The spirit of the spear. For those of you who have read it, there's a book called The Spear of Destiny. It is the spear that supposedly pierced the side of the Messiah. As he went to the Habsburg Museum one day, and by the way, he went to the Habsburg Museum because he believed himself to be of the Habsburg line. 
He was, in fact, the illegitimate son of one of the Habsburgs. The Habsburgs are one of the controlling dynasties of the world. The Habsburgs are part of the Merovingian dynasties that believe they are direct descendants from Jesus the Messiah and Mary the Magdalene. The last temptation of Christ really alluded to that relationship. That the Messiah didn't really die. They hauled him off the cross and he took off to have homosexual relations and to run off with this, quote, whore, in quote, Mary. And they produced offspring. And these are the 13 families. Not the 12 tribes, but the 13 families. The Habsburgs believed them. By the way, that was why Hitler killed all the Jews and the gypsies. You know, the gypsies had long been rumored to be the lost tribe of Dan. That's why he hated gypsies. He thought they were one of the 12 tribes. But they believed themselves to be the only true descendants, the only true Jews. The rest were a divorced Jews, bastard Jews, that had no right to exist. That they were the true offspring of the Messiah, the 13 families, the Merovingian dynasties. That's why Hitler hated Jews. That's why Hitler killed gypsies. Anyway, Hitler went to the museum and saw the spirit of the spear arise out of the spear that had supposedly pierced the side of the Messiah. And the spirit came out and it took him high above all the earth. And it showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and said, all these are yours. Do my bidding. And Hitler believed that he was to be the one to rule the world, to set up the new millennium, the third Reich. Well, it didn't come about. It didn't happen. It wasn't to be. But that was the third horse. Have you noticed that each, each time the Lord is giving us more detail as the horses ride and the beasts are presented? Have you noticed also that their time span seem to be getting shorter? The British Empire goes back to the 1500s, at least early 1600s. Remember, it was Sir Francis Bacon way back in the 1600s speaking of the United States of America. He said, this is the new Atlantis from which the new Atlantean covenant will spring. They had their new age, new world order, occultic designs on this place back then. And you, of course, remember the lost continent of Atlantis. Of Atlantis. Not, not completely mythology, by the way. Because the lost continent of Atlantis is, in fact, the earth at the time of the flood of Noah. Remember, Atlantis was, 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 was destroyed by a deluge. And what was the Atlantean covenant? Well, the Atlantean covenant, ladies and gentlemen, was the law system they are ushering into us right now. What does the scripture say about it? It said that the, rule, the world was ruled by men of evil, whose every thought was evil continually. Remember what this was about. This was the time of the Nephilim and the Raphaim. This is the time of the Nephilim when those Nephilim, those fallen angels, came down and they saw that the daughters of men were fair. And they took unto them wives. And they had children, the scripture says in Genesis 6. And these were the mighty men of old, the men of renown. There were giants in the land. These were the Nephilim's offspring, the Raphaim, the mighty men of old, the men of renown. And every one of their thoughts was evil continually. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Atlantean covenant. That's what George Bush and the New World Order planners have in mind for you right now. That is the Atlantean covenant they're bringing back. Speaking of Noah... He was called a preacher of righteousness. Who was what? Pure in his generations. There was no Nephilim blood flowing through him. And by the way, these Nephilim existed, these Nephilim and these Raphaim existed both before and after the flood, according to the scriptures. Now the scriptures tell us it'll be just as it was in the days of Noah, by the way. Guess what we just saw, folks? Hail Bop just went whizzing by. 
Hail Bop has not been here in 4,000 years. That is, Hail Bop has not been here since the time of Noah. You want a mile post? There it is. Won't be back for another 4,000 years. So either this world is going to stick around for another 4,000 years, ladies and gentlemen, or we are beginning now to see the last moments of history unraveling before us. I believe it to be the latter, not the former. I believe we are in the last of the last days. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that we are coming down to the very end of the end. And I believe the Lord is giving us mileposts. One is Hail Bop. Because Hail Bop went through at the time of Noah as well. What does it mean? It means that if your preacher is telling you all is well, just fill up the collection plate. Whether knowingly or unknowingly, he's lying to you. All isn't well. Days of tribulation are coming upon this land, upon this earth, such as never have been before, ever. We are going to see horrors so horrible that we cannot imagine. Go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse... And his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto, over, unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. To kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beasts of the earth. To kill with hunger. Well, I'll start out with a sword. To kill with a sword. I recently interviewed Casper Weinberger, former Secretary of Defense under Ronald Reagan, the ultimate insider. CFR, Trilateral Commission, you name it, he is it. He's got a new book out called The Next War. I've got it on my table out there. If you have not read it, it is a must read. He lays out five scenarios for World War III. Guess what, folks? Pentagon and CIA models show us losing. Can't be. We're America. Sin makes you stupid, folks. We elected Bill Clinton twice. He has gutted the military. He has gutted our ability to even su survive a nuclear attack. He has completely dismantled all Star Wars. He has completely dismantled our ability to create tritium gas. That is the gas that makes the nuclear weapons operate. It lasts about 12 years. He did that the first thing when he came to office. We're five years into it. After about six years, you don't know whether it's reliable or not. In Cap Weinberger's scenario, World War III, the Russians take all of Europe except for, guess what, England and Spain and Italy. Why? You got the Pecci family in Italy that is one of the Merovingian dynasties. You have the Juan Carloses of Spain that is one of the Merovingian dynasties. And, of course, who's going to touch England? England controls Russia. The United States ends up paying $100 billion a year in tribute to the Soviet Union, not to nuke us. In Cap Weinberger's Pentagon-run scenario. China, the 200 million man army that Scripture talks about, yeah, well, China's now got bases in Long Beach, California, and also just south of there. China controls both ends of the Panama Canal starting this year. Oh, yeah, there's a company in Hong Kong that's got the leases. Hong Kong becomes Red China in July, folks. We just had to give the Chinese over a billion dollars aid to build ships in our country to a local ship manufacturer in Georgia. Why? Why are we paying tribute to the Red Chinese? 
Why is Bill Clinton's entire campaign financed by the red Chinese? Is he afraid of them? Is he just a coward or is he a traitor as well? He is both. But sin makes you stupid. We elected him. To kill with the sword. And by the way, Cap and Weinberger lays out five scenarios. Now each, each one is as gut-wrenching as the one before. By the way, in case anybody's wondering why I would interview such a guy, they keep saying that we in the Patriot, the Christian Patriot community, are dangerously paranoid. So I wanted one of their guys to be dangerously paranoid too. So I put him on tape. He's just as dangerously paranoid as we are. So the next time they accuse me, I'll hand him Cap Weinberger's tape and say, well, get him first. I think that's why Ronnie lost his memory. He just, he just didn't want to think about it anymore. I don't know, talk to Cap, he knows. Give me a jelly bean and talk to Cap. To kill with the sword and with hunger. I'm told that I'm a fear monger because I'm telling people, if you have not stored up several years supply of food, you will probably at some point in time die of hunger. So God's gonna sovereignly provide for us. Well, did he sovereignly provide a boat for Noah? Or did he tell Noah to build the thing? Did he sovereignly provide food for Joseph or did he tell him to collect food for seven years? Oh yeah, but we're American Christians. Yeah, we're the horrors that have let them kill 70 or 40 million babies at the abortuaries, the altar of the god Moloch. You see, folks, the call of the Lord in the last days he doesn't find a good church and get in it. What does the Spirit say? It says, come out of her, my people, lest ye participate in her plagues, her tortures. Remember the whore that's riding on the beast. That's the church. What happens to her? They destroy her utterly, burn her with fire, and devour the flesh of her children. Yeah, find a good church and get in it. Get a t-shirt that says, I'm an hors d'oeuvre for the new world order. <laughs> because the church that is going to be so anxious to sell you out, to turn you in. Why do you think the Lord says, come out of her? Because folks, they're going to be anxious to turn you in. They're going to think they're doing God's service when they turn you over to the new Gestapo, to Butch and the boys. They're actually going to think they're going to be so deceived, so brain dead, so warped, so demonic. They're actually going to think they're doing God's service when they turn you over to the tormentors. The Lord says, pray that your flight not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. Well, we know two things. Winter's always going to be and Sabbath's always going to be. Because he's talking about the end of the end times. What does he say? Pray that your flight not be then. Why? Because in the wintertime, the corn was in the barns, the corners of the field had been gleaned, and there was nothing but snow on the ground and cold weather to truck in. Pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath. You couldn't buy or sell or trade on the Sabbath. You were out, to luck, out of luck on the Sabbath. What is he saying? See the handwriting on the wall and make your plans while you can. Prepare in advance for that which surely must come upon this once great land. And yet the church is telling us all that, oh, we're going to get raptured out of here before anything bad happens. Well, tell the 12 and 13 year old Sudanese boys that are being martyred right now, beautiful little black children, being literally, literally nailed to crosses because they refuse to give up their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, that there's going to be no tribulation for them. Two million have now died. Where is America crying against this slaughter of innocence? 
are nowhere to be found. And you know why? Because it's a poor country like Sudan, and these are blacks. This is the most racist government on the face of the earth. They call the patriot community racists. And there are some. And those of you who listen to my program on a regular basis know just exactly how I feel about racism. But yet this hypocritical government, this apostate bunch of lying, murdering thugs, will let two million black Sudanese Christians be murdered, martyred, because A, they're black, and because B, they're poor. What do we care? Like the abortuaries in this country. 78% of all of the abortuaries are in black neighborhoods. Why? Because they were started by Margaret Sanger, folks. She was a eugenicist. Same as Adolf Hitler. She said blacks are breeding and swarming like rats in the street and must be eliminated. This is the organization we pay homage to. $280 million a year from our taxes goes to Planned Parenthood so that they can murder primarily black babies whom they hate. So wait a minute now, some black people working for it. Yeah, and it started in the 60s with what they called their Negro program. They couldn't find any reputable black leaders to endorse contraception and the murder of babies so they paid some unscrupulous black preachers, put them on television, and got them to endorse the murder of beautiful black babies, the ruining of lives. And the scripture says that the Lord's going to double what we have done. For everything they've done, double her cup, fill her cup twice what she has done. 80 million are going to die for the abortuaries alone, folks. 80 million in this country are going to die for the abortuaries alone. That is prophesied. That is Bible law. Now, unless Yahweh is a liar, 80 million people are going to die. Well, Revelation chapter 6 tells us how a fourth of the population of the earth is going to die, folks. 1.5 billion, with a B, 1.5 billion people are going to die. With the sword and with hunger and with death. What is death? Death! Men's hearts failing them for fear. It is going to be so awful, so horrific, so absolutely, indescribably horrible. But men's hearts are simply going to they simply will not be able to view the visage and live. It will be so awful that men's hearts will fail them for fear. Now, oh, but all's well. Go back to your church. Walk in, sit down, shut up, pay up and get out. All's well. And with beasts of the earth... The word beast there is the Greek word therion. Therion. Therion has two meanings, wild beasts and venomous beasts. There are right now in this country 300 Islamic cell groups with enough bacteriological warfare weaponry to wipe out 230 million Americans according to the CIA model run. Babylon, Babylon the Great has fallen, has fallen. 300 Islamic cell groups, ladies and gentlemen, NBC, ABC, CBS, and CNN have all done hour-long specials on the threat of bacteriological chemical warfare on the United States. Many of the models they used were the Pentagon's models. They didn't tell you everything. But if you follow the Pentagon model all the way through, you see the 230 million Americans die. Therion, venomous beasts. By the way, they can accomplish this in a day. When they release these plagues, it happens instantly. And we can't treat it. One city being hit would wipe out all, all of the medication in the entire country. 
Well, I wouldn't wipe out all. <laughs> Baker household's got enough set aside. But they call me crazy. They say that I'm they say that I'm just a prophet of doom. But I don't think it's doom to tell people how to save their lives. I think it's doom when you sit around fat, stupid, and happy, letting people walk into an ambush. That is truly a prophet of doom. But a fourth of the people are going to die, folks. And we ain't going to get raptures out of here. Beam me up, Scotty, only works on Star Trek. Look at verse 9. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Yeah, the Lord's going to sovereignly protect the remnant. He's going to preserve a remnant. But when they lift up the altar up in heavens, when the Lord lifts up that altar, what happens? The souls under there cry out, How long, O Lord, how long do you avenge us? The Lord said, Settle down. There's some more folks about to join you. They're coming out of the great tribulation. Why are they dying? For the word of God and for the testimony which they held. I believe the Lord is going to sovereignly protect many of us, many of you. He's going to have to sovereignly protect me, I know. I've gone about as high profile as you can get. <laughs> i got very few places to hide. But it says, blessed are they that die in the Lord from this point on. You think they can honestly scare me with heaven? Behave yourself or I'm sending you on to be with Jesus. Folks, I don't know many folks that work many longer hours than me. I'm a dichotomy. I work extremely long hours, but I'm probably the laziest guy I know. I hate it. If they want to send me on to be with the Lord for the next few years while we're waiting for all this to shake out and the Lord comes back on a white horse charging... sword of the spirit an absolute and total victory Are you going to set me on a horse beside the Messiah and that is supposed to somehow make me afraid you recognize me I'll be the one yelling yee sitting beside him listen folks they can't threaten me with anything if I go on to be with Jesus I go on to be with Jesus I'll be back When we come back, the circumstances are a whole lot better. It is coming, ladies and gentlemen. There is judgment coming to America. I, I believe that, that America is Babylon. I believe we are that great Babylon. I have gone repeatedly through the scriptures and trying to find some other, some other country that could match the description from Revelation 18, and I simply cannot find one. I simply cannot find a nation that can fulfill all of those prophetic criteria except the United States. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is fallen. Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. You know, it's interesting. I believe there is nation Babylon, and then there is city Babylon according to Revelation, and, be, ooh, wow. and because of the time, we're not going to go into that today. You're going to have to take my word for it. Actually, don't. Go to the scriptures, you'll see it. There is nation Babylon and city Babylon. I believe New York City to be that city. I believe America to be that nation. Isn't it interesting that it says, by the way, it says the whore that sits on many waters. And instantly that picture of the Statue of Liberty popped in my mind, instantly. Saw the whore sitting on many waters. Remember, that was a gift from the French. That wasn't about our American Republic. That was about their French Republic. The French Republic that I believe is an archotype of the New World Order where deity worship, that is, the worship of Yahweh, was banned for three and a half years. That is where they did the ceremonial thing with the prostitute off the street where they wrapped her in thin linen gauze. 
And they took her to the temple, I mean to the cathedral of St. Paul's, and they slowly unwrapped her and named her the goddess of reason and then had an orgy and said reason must be worshipped. Not an unreasonable God. That was who gave us the Statue of Liberty. The whore that sits on many waters. It says that this city has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Isn't it interesting? In the ecological programs that the EPA and other wildlife groups are doing, they're taking buzzards and eagles and hawks and all of these scavenger birds, and they're taking them to New York City. And they're letting them nest in the tops of the skyscrapers. It's like living on a mountain for the birds, except for the cars, but I mean, it's high up. And they prey perfectly on the rats and the vermin the city produces. Well, if you go back to scripture to find out what is a clean bird, what is an unclean bird, you'll find out that every one of these predator birds, the owls, the hawks, the eagles, etc., are all unclean birds. And this city, prophetically now, has become the hold, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Amazing, isn't it? Not one speck, not one speck of prophecy is missed in the Lord's economy of scale. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Did you know that the largest white slavery ring in the entire world is run out of New York City? And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The United States is the largest producer of pornography in the world. When they took down the, uh, the Iron Curtain, when it rusted, by the way, it's not gone. We'll, I don't think we'll have time to get into that, but we may. When the Iron Curtain, quote, fell, pornography flooded in to Russia. Billions upon billions upon billions of dollars of pornography went to people who couldn't even afford to buy food. Where did they get the money for pornography? <laughs> Privately financed porn for the destruction of the nations. All came from America. For all of the nations of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through her abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye not receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she has rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. And the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. The CIA, the largest drug-running operation in the world. Oh, you say it can't be, not the CIA. Why do you think George Bush went down and got Manuel Noriega? He got tired of him skimming. Think about it, folks. We went to a sovereign nation, picked up a sovereign ruler of a sovereign nation, brought him back to the United States, and threw a sovereign butt in a prison for all these years. Huh? They took our people hostage in Iran. We were ready to go to war. Jimmy Crater sent helicopters in there to crash in the desert. And by the way, that's, that's, become a, that's become a shrine for them. They actually make pilgrimages to it. Sin makes you stupid, doesn't it? Gee, Merry Christmas. Imagine if North Korea kidnapped the President of the United States. Do you think we'd sit around and say, well, go ahead and try and we'll see how it comes out? I mean, with Bill, it'd be a good idea, but we wouldn't. Even for Bill, we'd go down there. And we'd go get Manuel Noriega, and Panama's supposed to say, shoot, I got our guy. Huh? This is, this is a sovereign nation. Why would we go into a sovereign nation and grab a sovereign leader? especially for a pest hole like Panama. They aren't even the drug producers. 
They're just middlemen. They got tired of him skimming. I just interviewed Gene Tatum. He had a personal conversation with this satellite phone, this sat phone thing. Bush was on one end, he was on the other, and Bush was screaming because Manuel Noriega was still alive and surrendering. You know, he called all the TV uh, people and all the camera crews and everything so that when he surrendered, they couldn't kill him. Pineapple ain't as dumb as he looks. He said, wait a minute, hold her, Newton. If they get me in private, I'm history. So he, he called all the television crews in for his surrender. Come on down, we've got a sovereign leader of a sovereign nation. We have become the largest drug dealer in the world. How many, how many people have our drugs killed around the world and here in the United States? Millions. Millions have died for our drugs. What do you think the drive-by shootings in California, in L.A., New York, Chicago, Des Moines, what do you think they're about, folks? They're about drugs, turf. Easily 100 million people have died as a result of our evil. What do you think Vietnam was about? Two things. The Golden Triangle's drugs, George Bush, by the way, and mobile oil. George's oil interests. Don't forget, it's England that controls the drug routes through China. That's why the constant enmity between Britain and France, British Freemasonry versus French Freemasonry, both vying for control of the drug routes of the world. And this all goes back to the Merovingian dynasties, etc., etc., etc. We don't have time for it today. We are, ladies and gentlemen, the only nation on the face of the earth that can meet the criteria for Revelation 18. Double to her. Well, if they double what we've done, folks, as 100 million, there's a couple hundred million Americans going to have to get dead. But how many die at this horse's ride? 1.5 billion people are going to die, folks. Jacques Cousteau will be dancing on his little wet, slippery feet. He says that 350, 350,000 people a day should die to stabilize the world's population. A day. I believe it's either 250 or 3 or 350. I don't remember the exact figure. 250,000. 300,000, 350,000. 50,000 here, there, you know. To a guy like Jacques, what does it matter? As long as he isn't one of them. 250,000 a day, folks, every four days. Every four days. That's a million people. It's about 100 million a quarter. How much hath she glorified herself and lived deliciously? So much torment and sorrow give her. For she hath said in her heart, I sit as a queen. I am no widow. I shall see no sorrow. Is that not what we've said? We're America. We're America! I'm no widow. I'll see no sorrow. By the way, that phrase, I shall see no sorrow, that is a phrase that means I won't lose my children. I shall see no sorrow. I'm no widow. I shall see no sorrow. I won't lose my husband. I won't lose my kids. Well, we're nothing, what can touch us here in America? The greatest medical system in the world. The richest country on the face of the earth. What could happen to us? I shall be no widow. I shall see no sorrow. I'm not going to lose my kids. And yet, in a day, in a day, one verdict comes down and 40 million babies die and we're seeing sorrow. Euthanasia is beginning to happen all over. They're throwing patriots in prison for homeschooling their kids, and yet Jack the Dripper Kevorkian has now killed 40 people, and he's still walking around. And he mocks the courts by showing up in the dress of the Founding Fathers. I shall see no sorrow. I shall be no widow. 
just did an AP Wire story Friday on my program. And in that AP Wire story, they talked about the fact that doctors were now harvesting organs before patients had died. And it was legal. Who's next? You? Me? You think patriots might be good organ donors? Therefore, shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is Yahweh who judgeth her. Do you think, folks, do you think that we're going to get away with this? Do you think the pillow prophets are right, that all is well? Go to Psalm 94, 20. Psalm 94, verse 20, 21. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. Is that not what we've done? We have passed by law the right to murder the unborn, and it's all right because we did it by law? And yet if you even protest outside of an abortion clinic, They'll get you with the face laws and lock you up and throw away the key. How dare you have the audacity to protest our murder of children? Second Kings 24, 1 through 4. I'm not going to read it because we're cutting short on time. I'm getting the 15 minute sign here, so I'm going to have to hurry. 2 Kings 24, 1 through 4 talks about the fact that the sins of Manasseh have risen too high. And the Lord says, I'm going to wipe them out utterly from being a people and for the shedding of innocent blood. The Lord said, you shed innocent blood in your village and it's not avenged by law. I personally, the Lord says, I personally will destroy your village. Gagging, choking on the blood of 40 million slaughtered innocent children. Do you think, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord is going to turn his back because we're America? Folks, we're not even the chosen. <laughs> Chicago isn't the new Jerusalem. Israel is still the apple of God's eye. If he is willing to destroy them, he is willing to destroy us. By the way, he gave them a bill of divorcement. What is a bill of divorcement? See, in our society, we believe divorce ends a marriage. It doesn't. The biblical model of divorce is a time of separation waiting for reconciliation. It doesn't end anything. It simply separates two combatants until such time as they can be reconciled. The Lord said, he blinded Israel that we might be grafted in. When we have become a cancer on the vine, you suppose he's going to leave us grafted in? If he was willing to remove Israel, will he not remove the United States? Isaiah 17 talks about the removal of Damascus. How does that fit in with Babylon? Babylon the Great has fallen, has fallen. Well, it's simple. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a cabal being formed right now. In fact, it is formed. December 10th, a congressional report came out talking about a nine-nation cabal that had formed in the Middle East to push Israel into the sea and to make war with the United States, the great Satan. It is coming, ladies and gentlemen. There is a war game going on right now with 200 ships involved. It has an Arab name, an Islamic name, but... It means the road to Jerusalem. That's happening now, today, while we're here. That is happening. This is not a game. The entire world is on the verge of breaking into war. We have an area of the world I call chaos stand. Because of time constraints, we are not going to have a chance to go into it now. 
but it basically covers Eurasia, Africa, and the Middle East. Just as World War II did not start in 1941, but rather in 1931, World War III is not going to start when the entire world explodes into a nuclear holocaust. It has started already. 1931, China, Japan invaded China, Manchuria. 1933, Italy invaded Ethiopia. 1935, Hitler had consolidated power and was already waging war on the continent of Europe. And yet we still have the Neville Chamberlains running around saying, I have in my document, in my hand, a document that will secure peace for this continent. The only thing he secured was a place in infamy in history for being such an idiot. Well, Neville Clinton is in the White House now. He's appeasing the Chinese. Meanwhile, they're making ready for war. Isaiah 17 talks about the destruction of Damascus. Damascus, by the way, has never been destroyed. Probably the oldest city in the world, one of the oldest cities in the world. Never been destroyed. And yet Isaiah 17 clearly talks about the city being reduced to rubble, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks, which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, the kingdom from Damascus. And the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Folks, Damascus has never been destroyed. <laughs> this prophecy awaits us yet. By the way, it goes on to talk about how Israel fares in all of this. Israel is reduced to, well, says the fatness of Jacob is made thin. The harvest will be not gathering the olives from the tree, but a few berries from the top of the tree, from the outermost limbs. The harvest will be like the gleaning of the corners of the field. They'll get by, but barely. But Damascus is yet to be destroyed. Imagine a scenario now where all of the nations of the earth come against Israel. That, by the way, is prophetic. The United Nations last week on Thursday passed a resolution condemning Israel for building in East Jerusalem. All of the nations of the earth came against Israel. Israel, by the way, is not in violation of the Oslo Accord building there. The Oslo Accord contains no restriction as to building in Jerusalem in any way, shape, or form vis-a-vis -vis Israel. The Oslo Accord absolutely forbids the PLO or the Palestinian Authority, the PA, from having national or international offices in Jerusalem, and yet they have seven offices in Jerusalem. So we're seeing the twisting and turning, the lying that is going on. Why? Because it is all leading to the prophetic conclusion that all the world will come against Israel. And the Lord says always, I'll punish Israel for her sins. Lord knows she is apostate. Lord knows she is anti-Christ. But he says when I punish her, I'll punish her with nations that are even worse than she. <laughs> and woe be unto them by whom the punishment comes. But Damascus is going to be destroyed, obliterated. I can see a scenario, ladies and gentlemen, where war breaks out. Shots are fired. Missiles are launched. Israel launches nukes against Damascus, against Ephraim, Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, Syria is demolished. It is no more. The dam in Egypt is blown up. Flooding takes place. Every scenario you can think of is breaking loose. Meanwhile, what happens? Accidentally, the Dome of the Rock is obliterated. Gosh, we got this big empty plot of ground here now. Maybe we should build a temple on it. And they rebuild a temple. A quickie temple, but a temple. Three and a half years later, they've done the red heifer thing. They purified the temple. Meanwhile, in all of this confusion, because when war starts in the Middle East, it goes everywhere. 
instantly. Gas, oil prices go to $100 a barrel. The economy is absolutely destroyed. Havoc reigns in the United States. New York City is nuked. It's gone no more. In fact, the scripture goes on to say that no more will be heard in her forever the sound of the trumpet or the flutist or the mill even. Not even the grain mill will grind there ever again. New York is destroyed. L.A. is destroyed. The United Nations has no headquarters. Chaos reigns across the world. Europe is involved in war. Russia is advancing. The Taliban army is marching from Afghanistan into the former Soviet provinces. Meanwhile, the man of lawlessness arises on the scene. He says, we need a headquarters. Hey, everything's blown up. <laughs> New York's gone. Miami's gone. L.A.'s gone. Vegas is gone. There's bacteriological warfare all over Europe. I got it. Let's go to Jerusalem. My, so much of Jerusalem has been destroyed. Where can we go in this time of crises? Where can we unite the peoples of the earth, the Arabs and the Jews and the Christians? Well, let's go to the temple. The gathering place through the centuries for all the religions of the earth. And when the man of lawlessness sets up shop there, those who are on a rooftop shouldn't come down and take anything, just flee. You're in a field, don't go back to your house to get anything, flee. Flee. Run. Because we pass from tribulation to great tribulation. The second half being worse than the first. And we're there, folks. We're not sitting on some cloud strumming some harp. You ain't up yonder polishing a halo. You're here. The streets are occupied with roving bands of bandits. Murdering, raping, pillaging. Former politicians, you know. Literally, things have gotten so bad that human beings are eating other human beings. Now, it won't be a donkey's head selling for a month's wages to make soup. It'll be humans eating humans. Scripture says that they stand afar off. The kings of the earth and the merchants of the world stand afar off, weeping, wailing, mourning. Alas, alas, Babylon has fallen, that great city, that mighty city. For in one hour thy judgment has come, standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas. Why are they standing afar off? Well, folks, if you've got 230 million dead bodies from anthrax, bubonic plague. You have nuclear destruction. You have cannibalism. And every horror that you can possibly imagine and horrors that no human can possibly imagine yet taking place. Do you think they're going to come here? No, they stand afar off. Weeping, wailing, screaming in agony. job really that important? Hey folks, we're out of time. You can play all the religious games you want, but we're out of time. Folks, I'm not about restoring the Constitution. It's too late. It's over. 
Judgment is not coming, ladies and gentlemen. Judgment is here. People ask me if I think Bill Clinton is going to bring judgment to America. No, folks, he is judgment to America. The Congress of the United States is judgment on America. The crime we experience in the cities. When I was a kid, I left my home. When we would go on vacation once a year, it was always the annual ritual of trying to find the keys to the stupid house because we never locked a door. Now when I put the car in the garage, I lock the car doors and close the garage door. See, the law is eternal, but we threw it out. The law of the Lord says, thou shalt not murder, but we threw it out. And now murder is everywhere. The law of the Lord said, thou shalt not steal, but we threw it out. So now stealing is everywhere. The law of the Lord said, thou shalt not covet. And yet we built an entire system upon it. Our entire welfare system is a violation of the law against coveting. Coveting is when you devise a legal means to take from someone that which is not yours. The entire welfare system is a violation of the laws against coveting. We have become a whorish people. We've sold our birthright for a mess of pottage. And in a day, in an hour, sudden destruction is coming, folks. And you've got to make some decisions. Unfortunately, I can't see your faces because of these lights, the way they're shining. I don't know if you're listening or if you're getting ready to throw things or what you're doing. But you need to make some decisions. You're out of time for sitting on a fence. It's done. It's over. You need to withdraw from the little religious club that you've been going to get into a relationship with Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Patriotism ain't going to save you. Judgment is coming, folks. You need to make decisions now. At what point in time will I say no more? At what point in time am I going to refuse to walk any further into this system? At what point in time do I say, no, I'm stopping here, I'll go no further? You need to make it now while you can, because the time is coming shortly, very shortly, when you're going to be in the heat of the fire, in the middle of the battle. You won't be able to make it then. Make it now. Have you made plans where are you going to meet your family when destruction comes? You may be at work, they may be at home. Folks, destruction is coming. In a day, in an hour. In a day, in an hour. Sudden destruction. No, this is America. In a day, in an hour, folks, I tell you. It all ends. Life as you know it ends. Hopefully you put away food, water, some gold, some silver, and of course, the other precious metal, lead. Hopefully you've been wise enough to do those things. But more importantly, I hope you put away faith, Yeshua the Messiah, and his law in your heart. Twelve times in Revelation, the remnant is identified, and here's how it's identified. Not how often you go to church. Not how big a pompadour you can wear. Not how many people fall down when you touch them. Or how many you knock down when they get close. Here's the mark of the remnant. They hold to the commandments of Yahweh, the testimony of Yeshua, and they love not their lives, even unto the death. That's the mark of the remnant. Not how big a house how big a car, how big a Jesus. They hold to the commandments of Yahweh, the testimony of Yeshua, and they love not their lives even unto death. World War III, ladies and gentlemen, is a heartbeat away, and we will lose. Are you ready for life? After Babylon has fallen. But lest we leave here too, 
discouraged. <laughs> I guess I'm not exactly what you'd call a pillow prophet because I've been told that sometimes after listening to me, folks have a hard time sleeping. I'm more of a walking prophet. After you hear it, you want to walk. <laughs> away from me as fast as you can. <laughs> There's another king coming, folks. This is the closing chapter from Checkmate, the Game of Princes. And I, I try and close with this because I don't want anybody walking out feeling hopeless. It's not about hopelessness. It's about hopelessness for a nation. But it's about hope in Yeshua the Messiah. The princes feel they've moved all the pieces into all of the right positions. They are poised to declare check and take control, declaring themselves king as they establish their new world order. But there is yet another prince coming, the Prince of Peace. And it is he who has been declared by and throughout all eternity king. And it is he, when all the plays have been made and all the players revealed, who will thunder from the heavens, checkmate. And then the game's over, folks. From Dr. S. M. Lockridge, first time I heard this mighty, mighty man of God, this beautiful black preacher, do this passage. I knew I had to have it in my book because it summed up everything I was trying to say and didn't know how. I can't imagine the anointing that must have been on him when he preached this, but I tell you, every time I keep a tape of it and I listen to it, and it melts me to my shoes every time I hear it. The Bible says my king is a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews. That's a racial king. He's the king of Israel. That's a national king. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Yes, that's my king. Well, I wonder, do you know him? David said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline his shoreless supply. No barrier can hinder him from throwing out his blessings. He is enduringly strong. He is entirely sincere. He is eternally steadfast. He is immortally grateful. He is empirically powerful. He is impartially merciful. Well, I wonder, do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He is God's son. He is the sinner's savior. He is the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in the solitude of himself. He is august. He is unique. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He is the supreme problem in higher criticism. He is the fundamental doctrine of theology. He is the core, the necessity of spiritual religion. He is the miracle of the age. He is the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He is the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior, I wonder. He supplies strength for the weak. He is available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards, he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives the sinners. He discharges the debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He purifies the meek, I wonder. Well, my king is a key of knowledge. He is a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway to glory. Do you know him? Well, his office is manifold. His promise is sure. His light is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteousness, and his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. Ah, oh, I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable. He is God. He is incomprehensible. He is invincible. He is irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yes, that's my king, that's my king, and thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever, however long that is, and ever and ever. And when you get through with all of the forevers, then amen. And amen. And amen. 
now. Now let the weak say, I am strong, for he is my king. That's the blessed assurance. He is my king. Before y'all run off, there is one last thing that we would like to take care of. You know, folks, I love prophecy conferences like this, not because I have a chance to speak, but because I have a chance to be with all of you and with all of the other speakers and all of the people that Yahweh brings together for these blessed events. You don't know yet, perhaps, what an honor it is, but you're going to find out in the very near future what an honor it is to have comrades in arms, that is, those of faith who will stand with you through thick and thin, because at a very short point in time, you are going to be all you have. This little tiny remnant here may be, may be the ones that gather together to protect each other and support each other and help each other and admonish each other and teach each other and share wisdom and a shoulder to cry on and someone to help hide you when they're coming for you, to help spirit you away in the night when they have to, to lower you in a basket over the wall. But these events have to keep taking place across the country. And if each event doesn't pay for itself, we can't go on to the next city. Now, I say we because I've been invited to a number of these. I'm not in any way connected with them, though. I didn't come here for pay. I don't get paid for doing these. I've never asked for pay. I come here because I love each and every one of you, because I love the word of the Lord. And because time is so short, I'm the watchman on the wall. I've been given to cry out the message, and that's all I can do. But if Jeff Baker or Dr. Rod Lewis or any of the other speakers that, that come to these things, if any of them are going to continue, or Sam Mars or any of them are going to continue on, that means there has to be people that put these together. And if they don't pay for themselves, they can't go on to the next city toward the next batch of believers, the next batch of remnant, the next called out ones. So I'm going to ask each of you, as they pass the baskets there, to give as much as you can. It's a free will offering. No one holds a gun to your head. 